Maximus to Gloucester. I don't mean just like that to put down the widow Babson, whose progeny and property is still to be found and felt on Main and Middle Street at Joppa or in Wellesley Hills. My Aunt Vendler had a house on Laurel Avenue before Babson had his institute there, and once, when I was older, I swung by in a girl's father's hubmobile, and Lord, how the house had been inflamed in my memory. Or Geoffrey Parsons, whom the places over the cut as the man who owned all the land and boulders, all the hill and hollow, I know best in all the world how stage fort is, what Babson called it, the only hundred acres on this cape could possibly have fit the foolish hope of Somerset and Dorset men to do on this rock coast what England might have thought New England might be. But just there lies the thing that fishermen's field, stage head, stage fort, and now in all my childhood, a down dilly park for cops and robbers, baseball, firemen's hose, north end Italian Sunday spreads, nighttime Gloucester, monkey business, stays the first place Englishman, first felt the light and winds, the turning from that view of what is now the city. The gulls the same, but otherwise the sounds were different for those 14 men. Probably the ocean ate deeper in the shore, crashed further up at Cressy's. Why, they take their shelter either side of softer stage head and let tablet rock buff for them the weather side. On the lee, below the ridge which runs from my house straight to tablet rock, there, Dorset, Somerset men built the company house which Endicott thought grand enough to pull it down and haul it all the way to Salem for his governor's abode. And house built at Cape Ann, which Walter Knight and the rest said they built for Dorchester men. The point is not that Beverly turned out to be their home, that Conant, Norman, Allen, Knight, Balch, Palfrey, Woodbury, Tilly, Gray are Babson's Parsons there, but that as I sit in a rented house on Fort Point, the Cape Ann fisheries, out one window, stage head looking me out of the other in my right eye, like backwards of a scene I saw the other way for 30 years, Gloucester in view, those men who saw her first. He left him naked, the man said, and nakedness is what one means, that all start up to the eye and soul as though it had never happened before. A year that year was new to men. The place had bred in the mind of another. John White had seen it in his eye, but 14 men, of whom we know 11, 22 eyes and the snow flew, where gulls now paper the skies, where fishing continues and my heart lies. An actual earth of value to construct one. From rhythm to image, an image is knowing, and knowing, Confucius says, brings one to the goal. Nothing is possible without doing it. It is where the test lies, malgré all the thought and all the pell-mell of proposing it, or of thinking it out, or living it ahead of time. There is something to be said uh, about being that big thing, which is uh, the liability, I think. And I think it really was for my father. It says a lot about the person that my father became. I think he was 6'7 at 16 in 1926. That's comparative to like Shaquille O'Neal in 96 or something, where if you're bigger, you must be all the other things that go with bigger, like bigger brains, bigger feet, bigger ego, bigger sex, bigger, you know what I mean? Everything comes along with it. It was a liability, it was an advantage, it was a power, a mechanism. When he was five, his parents uh, decided to bring him to the coast, to Gloucester, from Worcester. Uh, there was a little cottage called Ocean Wood at Stage Fort Park. I think they spent every summer there until my father went off to college. 
that feeling that you get about uh, a summer place was etched in my father's heart or mind at, a, at an early age. My father started out as a very good student and then just got better. He was a president of his class sort of thing, got straight A's. He got a, uh, scholarships both to Wesleyan, where he was an undergraduate, and to Harvard. And uh, previous to that, he had gotten an uh, expense-paid trip to Europe, uh, the Grand Tour, it was called, and uh, it was for or oration. It was the west wind caught her up as she rose from the genital wave and bore her from the delicate foam home to her isle. And those lovers of the difficult, the hours of the golden day welcomed her, clad her were as though they had made her were wild to bring this new thing born of the ring of the sea, pink and naked. This girl brought her to the face of the gods, violets, in her hair. English garden. On August 6, 1945, the day he finished Omi Ishmael, Truman bombs Hiroshima. He became a poet. What happened was he was devastated in terms of the nature of humanity that we would drop nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This followed very shortly upon our discovery of Buchenwald, the Holocaust. He was deeply affected by that. So those two events simply discouraged any belief, any further belief in humanism, as, it, as it's been called since the Renaissance, the Greeks, and everyone before that. He's sitting in Washington wondering what to do. FDR was dead. Truman came in. He got a letter from Edward Dahlberg asking him to take his position over in Black Mountain. He had previously taught at Harvard and a Clark, I think even Yale, and he was hesitant to teach again up in the hills of North Carolina. But there were so many interesting people having already been there and there at the moment, and as it turned out, came on during those years, including Einstein, who I, I guess uh, had gotten on the board of directors, along with, I thought, Jung too. And uh, I didn't know about William Carlos Williams, but the faculty was uh, included Merce Cunningham, John Cage, Walter Gropius, William de Kooning, Buckminster Fuller, and then my father. Of course, it's he remembers such things in such detail, like all of Dante and all of Shakespeare and all of stuff that, you know, he would just pull out little fragments of the Divine Comedy to use whenever he wanted, like someone would pull a spoon out of a drawer. He did not divide up subjects according to what he thought was important and what was not important. He went out and absorbed everything. Therefore, I think what we see in his poetry originated in a kind of openness to everything and a willingness to be open to everything that nowadays is increasingly rare, in part, I think, because of extremely programmed education. I find it awkward to call myself a poet or a writer. If there are no walls, there are no names. This is the morning after the dispersion. And the work of the morning is methodology, how to use oneself and on what. That is my profession. I am an archaeologist of mourning. It was exciting to be around someone like Olson, who was trying to get back to, to other mornings that were new and fresh in the world. Uh, when there were human beings engaged in seeing things brand new and new and fresh again. If you think of the, the way in which knowledge is organized ordinarily in the Western world, you have a series of subject matter. Each subject divides up the world and has a, a kind of take on what the whole world is through the, the abstract concepts that are the particular uh, business of each, of each discipline. And the consequence is that if you have any concrete piece of reality, like a city or a, a world, you can't really get at it as a whole. You only can get it piece by piece, and you have to sort of paste it back together again. So Olson's, part of Olson's picture is that a, a whole, totally different principle about how to organize knowledge. So instead of having a series of different disciplines which rise to an abstract 
generality and tell you about politics throughout the world, you see how politics actually works in the specific location. And that becomes a, a radically different way of organizing human knowledge. When Olson says, following his mentor Karl Artwin Sauer, that a landscape can be comprehended in a single glance, far too many people think about the space and the glance. The key is to comprehend. And the comprehension of a piece of the earth, shaped or unshaped, requires every discipline known to humanity to be welded into a seamless whole to understand it. He got us into the classroom and he said, uh, the, the name of this course is The Present. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to read the Asheville Citizen Times, that was the local daily, and we're going to read the New York Times. And we're going to see what's interesting. That's a great thing to call a course The Present. I mean, he really meant it. He thought that we could kind of keep up with what was really going on. Sometimes go all through the night and all the next day one time it went the second night. I mean, it went 24 hours. He was like, uh, like the sorcerer's apprentice. Once you got him cranked up, I mean, he was, uh, he was gone. When I saw him in the UK at the uh, Royal Albert Hall, he was actually leaning on the podium, and his feet were in the air and dancing. And you think of the the dancing shaman mediating the energies of the, the space, lifted by the physicality of the act. And the, you know, the sense of then, okay, the right, the ritual, so it's, a, it's redone, you're redoing, you know, you're re-enacting some basic, almost primal uh, energy. And I'm walking down 8th Street and there's this tall, tall, tall man and I suddenly realized it was Charles Olson. We stopped and talked for all of one minute, and I said, you know, I live about one block away. Why don't you come up and have supper with us? And there he met Woody Guthrie, and he asked Woody, would Woody like to write an article for a little magazine called Common Ground? Woody's article was called Ear Music, and he started off saying, I don't mean you pluck the guitar with your ear, I mean you don't need a, any paper to learn this kind of music. A beautiful description of folk music by one of the folks, and Charles Olson uh, printed it. Angus Cameron of Little Brown read it. Next thing you know, Woody was writing a book called Bound for Glory. When you look out from the eyes in your head, what do you see? What do you really see? Do you see what's there in the landscape where you live? Not its shadow or reflection or what you've been told lies there. Not just the present surface, but what came before. Do you understand what you see? And what if you don't understand? Are you willing to find out for yourself what is there, what's really there in the landscape when you look out from the eyes in your head? So let us begin. Let me show you something of this man of my own place, something remarkable on him. Like a coast has things which stand out like a white house or a clump of trees. Some such thing which has not heretofore been revealed of this man, who moved off from another place where he was born, who moved most gradually from this center out as far as a man then could go. And does it matter how far? As long as it is far. Can you say how far far is? You shall see this man move as far as space goes 
as you too have the opportunity to move. Outside the piazza of our camp, summer camp, at the border of Stage Four Park, which is now known to me as Fisherman's Field. And when I was a little boy, I used to see these men smoke and talk in the summer darkness, and the, had that quietness and fullness of nature to just sit where it was pleasant on a summer evening, like Chinese or Japanese or Indian. Or Italians, or Mesopotamians, or Hittites, or Greeks, or anybody that's ever lived in this earth knows that the earth is, is the geography of our being. My father was a letter carrier, and his uniforms were constantly in need of patching, particularly on the shoulder, where the bag was carried, and along the side of the coat, where the bottom of the bag wore the cloth away. In my father's mail pouch, I learned the love of letters. This was at Gloucester, letter 27, with Helm. I come back to the geography of it. The land falling off to the left, where my father shot his scabby golf, and the rest of us played baseball into the summer darkness until no flies could be seen and we came home to our various piazzas with the women. But there is no strict personal order for my inheritance. No Greek will be able to discriminate my body. An American is a complex of occasions, themselves a geometry of spatial nature. I have this sense that I am one with my skin. Plus this, plus this, that forever the geography leans in on me. I compel backwards. I compel Gloucester to yield, to change. Polis is this. He likes to use that word, so it's a Greek word, for the city-state, you know. And polis is eyes. Polis is those that you can personally know. I mean, the city-state, the Greeks said, it should be no larger than you can walk around the circumference of in two days. So that's the local again. And then from that, it just, it, the, the thing takes over. The poem takes over. The epic takes over. You, you cannot stay in the local. No matter how much you root in the local, you can't stay there because they, you know, like a tree, your arms go to heaven. In reading Olson, you could care a lot about the imagination of a world, watching it begin in a place, and you come to know quite a little something about the history of yourselves in that place. But the question, it, it's why are we interested in Troy, for example? It has to begin in some place, and then to watch human activity make a world. So Gloucester will fascinate anybody that is aware that we make our world if we are truly men and women in the world. When I first met him and had a terrible time with that New England history because it's so detailed, I began tracking it myself. He said, oh, don't do that. Said, you know, that, this is my place. You go do it for yours.
I remember, it's a, a very, a super, very familiar face. I might have given him a haircut, yeah. I was interested in the beats, and Kerouac was a New England guy, and he'd talk about the New York scenes, and then you know, Ginsburg and the village, and, and he'd talk about, well, if you go to Gloucester, there's this poet, Giles Olson, there. And I find them people, like, you know, like, a little bit too intellectual for me. I'm more like, you know, you know, direct understanding, correct? You know what I'm saying? Charles Olson is my teacher. I don't know anyone who had more freedom in his heart than Charles Olson. He changed my entire life. Can you tell me about Charles Olson? Charles Olson? Yeah, you ever hear of him? The poet? Yeah. Yeah, the big guy. Yeah, the big guy. I grew up down the Green Beach, and he used to walk the beach, and he wrote poems about us. My, the, all the kids I grew up with, go in the bookstore, and you'll find uh, a book by Charles Olson, and he writes about the kids on the beach. That's all me and my friends growing up. And I'm not a big poetry reader. You're not? No. How come? But, uh, I don't know how come. I just have so many other things I sort of get absorbed in and uh, don't get to the poetry part of it. Hey, John. Hey, how you doing? Why do you think people don't read poetry? That's a good question. Reading is all about getting uh, left brain information. It's about reading the Wall Street Journal. It's about reading nonfiction stuff. It's about reading law books. A lot of people don't get reading just for reading sick. And that's what poetry's all about. And if you don't get that... What a baptism. Talk about the doctrine of immersion. I went over the route this afternoon and the worst downpour ever known round these parts. Long walks between stops, but a good route for me this summer. Outdoors, good leg training, and I can work the route out myself instead of stepping on a regular's place. Oh boy, what a time I'll have trying to find these summer cottages and the people in them. Your loving son, Charles. Olson never forgot what the United States Post Office taught him to do, to understand an urban landscape in terms of not only streets, but patterns of street addresses. He knew Gloucester through things like the feel of the streets through his boot soles. And most letter carriers notice all sorts of things. The condition of sprouting plants in a garden, the sleeping dog, the newspaper left over from yesterday on the front porch. The local environment is the prism through which anyone's understanding of the cosmos is filtered. What I think Olson did that was spectacularly successful was twist the prism in his hands all the time and look through it toward an outer world from a vantage point in the local, the ward, the precinct, the corner of the street, his front steps, and perhaps above all, the window in his home that looked out over what many people would say was very ordinary and uninteresting, but for him was the threshold to the world. Olson's father was going to a postal convention. He was a, he was a mailman in Worcester. And he had this beautiful suitcase that, again, his parents had bought for him. His father wanted to borrow it to take to the convention so he would look good, because otherwise he just had a beat-up bag. Olson said no. The sad part is that his father then left the house and had a stroke and died a, a day or two after that, I believe, but without ever saying another word to Charles. Death alone defines life. And death is more than breathlessness or chance as it is on land these civilized days. When you come to grips with death, you've got more of a hold, slippery though it always is on the inescapable phantom. I guess I came to see to live with men who unawares do that every day even though I know I myself will continue to live landed and civilized. But there's something more, and, and I think that's why I'm here. As I passed up the wharf and saw Ben Pine talking to a gang of men sitting on the old spar, there was nothing unusual in that. But on my way back, Piney stopped me with, Olson, you want to go sword fishing? 
here's a man who will take you. And beside him stood a medium tall, youngish looking man in a clean white shirt and a turned down straw hat. Yes, come along. And it was over. Third letter on charges, unwritten. In this place is a poem which I've not been able to write, or a story, to be called The Eastern End of George's, about a captain I knew about, as of the days when it was important to race to market, to the Boston market, or directly into Gloucester, when she had fresh fish, and how this man had such careful charts of his own, of these very shallow waters along the way to market, if you were coming in from the winter cod grounds on the Eastern End. The point was to cut the corner if you were that good or that crazy, though he was as good as they come. He even had the charts marked in different colored pencil and could go over those rips and shoals dug out in a storm, driving a full loaded vessel and down to her deck edge. It is a vision, or at least an experience, I make off as though I have had to ride with a man like that. But the roar of this guy going through the snow and bent to a northeaster and not taking any roundabout way off the shoals to the north, but going as he was up and down Dale like a horseman out of some English novel makes it with me. And I want that sense here of this fellow going home. To get your legs, to get your rain leg. After weeks at sea, it's some funny thing to come on to the first again. And I think that also the great thing is that funny moment when you leave it. This is the way I might talk to a fish food I've had to learn the simplest things last, which made for difficulties. Even at sea, I was slow to get the land out or to cross a wet deck. The sea was finally not my trade. At it, I stood estranged from that which is most familiar. Olson writes at the beginning of Call Me Ishmael, I take space to be the central fact to man born in America. And he says, I spell it large because it comes large here, large and without mercy. When the first settlers got here, they were terrified by this open space. They were terrified by the wilderness. The corollary of that terror is this. Projective verse, verse now, 1950. If it is to go ahead, if it is to be of essential use, must I take it, catch up and put into itself certain laws and possibilities of the breath. Number one, the kinetics of the thing. A poem is energy transferred from where the poet got it. Number two, the principle. It is this, form is never more than an extension of content. Or so it got phrased by one, Robert Creeley, and it makes absolute sense to me. Olson was trying to think of a way of making clear, of proposing a, a method or a, or, or a way of pr proceeding. I mean, there's a lovely scene years ago with Larry Zonkas, and it was like the classic Super Bowl. And I think they were playing Minnesota, and they both teams were absolutely equal. <laughs> Both came with the game plan that they stuck to theirs. We began to respond to what was happening. And that sense of, of a poetry that can, can inform itself by what it's doing rather than by what it, quote, should be doing or must do or has to do or has done is a much more active and, 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 and engaging way of proceeding. Form is never more than the extension of content. In other words, you don't have to worry about the way they did it before. The way you're doing it now is going to project its own form. If you do it right, you're going to have form that's true to what you're doing and what you're talking about. That's awesome. I didn't know that he was famous or well-respected. He would come down to the dining room wrapped up in like a blanket and he always signed for his meals. They were charged. And uh, he would sometimes not give a tip, you know, and he'd tell me he'd catch up later. And he always did most generously. 
And it's funny because he often reminded me of an Emily Dickinson poem that I always loved. And the poem goes something like, Hi, I'm nobody. Are you nobody too? Shh, don't tell. They banish us, you know. How weary to be someone. How public like a frog. To tell your name the live long June to an admiring bog. And um, he never revealed who he was, never acted really important, and didn't give a damn what other people might think. Song three. This morning of the small snow, I count the blessings, the leak in the faucet which makes of the sink time the drop of the water on water as sweet as the Seth Thomas in the old kitchen. My father stood in his drawers to wind always. He forgot the 30th day, as I don't want to remember the rent. A house these days, so much somebody else's, especially Congoli. Or the plumbing, that it doesn't work. This I like, have even used paper clips, as well as string to hold the ball up and flush it with my hand but that the car doesn't, that no moving thing moves. Without that song, I'd void my ear of, the music racket of all ownership. Holes in my shoes, that's all right. My fly gaping, knee out at the elbows, the blessing that difficulties are once more. In the midst of plenty walk, as close to there. In the face of sweetness, piss. In the time of goodness, go side, go smashing, beat them, go as, as near as you can, tear. In the land of plenty, have nothing to do with it. Take the way of the lowest, including your legs. Go, contrary, go, sing. He had a political aspect to the work that I liked. It was political, it was also archaeological, you know, anthropological. And all of that together, for me, made a new horizon of what you could do. That you could take every aspect of your mind and utilize it as a poet. Not the obscure and the recondite, but what actually is the matter that moves the most people? What are the concerns of the people? Why are they those concerns? And the whole question of putting the hinge back on the door, that is, trying to find out what had been hidden from us by the, you know, the, the emergence of this new one-sided society. Uh, that was important, particularly for me being black, because I knew part of that was the connection to, to Africa. What, where, do, where, where are the foundations of the world from? You know, and and uh, Charles was saying you have to go back. You have to go back. Back. We'll go back and see what we were doing in the ice there, and we got fire, and then we could move again, and then we move and move. move. So it's the pattern of the human race going across the whole of uh, the Earth's surface. Then he moves even further when he finds out that those continents are all moving. This fascinates him. So it's the mo movement of place, and the movement of peoples, and then that ethos, the way we act with one another, that's central to his imagination. But it has to begin in any place. I guess the sad dilemma is simply what Olson takes from John Winthrop's address to the Mass Bay Colony. And Winthrop's point is beautiful, is that, the, that you know, make Boston shine upon its hills, et cetera, et cetera. But the point was that, that men could care about the kind of world they lived in, that they could care about it, and, and in that sense both care for it and care to have it that way. And I guess the dilemma presently is what kind of world are men and women caring to have? He wanted always to get back to the beginning because he really felt that it was only there that any change was possible. And if you're talking about political change, that that's the only possibility of changing form, of changing consciousness, of changing the, the uses of power. And specifically, I think, human masculine power, since that's the way it's been manifested since Homer. And as he would see it since Zeus took over and buried the titans underground, and Saul also considered himself a titan. Well, 
Olson was looking for a door to something else back of the, the classical Greek world, and he thought he had found it partly in the text of Hesiod, the Theogony. The Theogony's main subject is the war between the prior gods, the, the Titans, and the Olympians. And, and Zeus and the Olympians uh, defeat the Titans and throw them into Tartarus, this uh, strange sub Mediterranean universe, which prior to becoming a dungeon for the Titans had a different character as a, a productive and powerful and mysterious underworld, a world of earth forces and energies rather than celestial order. And Olson celebrates the, the Greek in a very beautiful way. The sea was born of the earth. Without sweet union of love, he see it says. But that then she lay for heaven She bare the thing which encloses everything Okeanos, the one which all things are And by which nothing is anything but itself Measured so I had a, an amazing dream about Charles. I was visiting Cairo. I was out back behind the museum, and it was daytime, but suddenly it was night. And he came up behind me, and he said, look up, and I looked up, and he said, so you can see the whole hypostasis. And when I looked up, instead of seeing the constellations, I saw the forms that lay behind the constellations. That's Charles. <laughs> It's in the night, it is, and it's not the forms we're used to seeing and the ones that give us comfort, it's something else. July 25th, 1957, Wednesday evening. Too excited, have just found a wonderful, crazy apartment. The rooftops of Gloucester. No stove, no refrigerator, no heat. But light. Oh, Charles, the light. And a little balcony. And what do I look at? The ocean and gulls. Flocks of gulls. A block from the water, right at the wharf. 28 Fort Square, do you know it? And now, to Garbo and Grand Hotel. I wish you were with me. Your body, my darling man. I miss your body, Betty. And I think the first one was written in uh, 50. And my plan was to write them only as letters to Vincent Freedy whenever I chose. I return to the city, and my first thought, Farini, is of you who for so long has been my body here, and I a shadow coming in like gulls. The harbor is big enough to be the size of the sky. The nights are not dead of sleep. Bird's eye is going all night. Sam said yesterday they are trying to force fishing to stay alive here. The future for rainy. Tourists, I hear the fishermen bellyache. Or just one big marina for what lawyer Burke called the outboard motor cowboys. I laugh from my height and decide to tell you stories, Farini, so long as you will listen to me. I'm going to start them today, and I'll send them to you as they get done, just one right after the other to amuse you. You see, I take it there are only two forms of mind about how it is human beings live on the earth. They either do, or they build dying chains to the moon. I want to go to England very soon to get the information to show how this city was in the mind of John White, even without his knowing what she was as a place to go fishing from. She is still a place to go fishing from. She is still Lur Beauport. She is a form of mind. Everybody has to find his or her place. You find a place and you operate from that place. Once you find that place, the place becomes the center of the whole cosmos. It's like the dot that keeps the circle going on. 
So the center and the circumference are the same thing, especially if you find your place and work that place to the best of your ability. So you participate in the process. And that's basically what he stood for, participate in the process. For anyone who grew up here, to see the difference in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, to see the changes, which in some ways were incremental, but which as you got closer to the 60s were extremely dramatic, it can be said that it was very real. There had been a loss of character. There had been a loss of the original beauty. I and mean, remember, painters came here to paint. We're not just talking about Fitzhugh Lane, who was a native. We're talking about uh, painters like Winslow Homer. We're talking about painters uh, like John Sloan, Stuart Davis. They came here to paint her because there was something extraordinarily unique. Olson saw that himself. He saw Gloucester as unspoiled. I felt the same way growing up here. For many, many, many years, it was very much itself and very unique. And when that began to change, it was very real and dramatic to see that change. Olson believed and drew the parallel that the Route 128 was going to be that mole, that causeway, that connection to uh, the rest of the world, and that would be the end of the uniqueness, and it would be the subjugation of Gloucester uh, to uh, the larger uh, megalopolis and the larger world. He'd been fighting all through the 60s, urban renewal. He's been fighting the filling of wetlands. He'd been fighting the tearing down of beautiful red brick uh, houses. He'd been fighting the change uh, in his, the historic West End. Poems, letters to the editor, and finding the Maximus poems where he'd said, Gloucester, you are no longer yourself. You're like uh, any other place. And when he saw that happening, he no longer uh, wanted to, uh, to be part of it. Scream to the editor, December 3rd, 1965. Moan the loss, another house is gone. Bemoan the present which assumes its taste. Bemoan the easiness of smashing anything. Bemoan a people who spend beyond themselves to flourish and to further themselves. As well made, the Solomon Davis house itself was such that George Washington could have been inaugurated from his second floor. How many ways can value be allowed to be careless with and Hagstrom destroyed? How many more before this obvious dullness shall cease? Oh, city of mediocrity and cheap ambition destroying its own shoulders, its own back greedy present person stood upon. Stop this renewing without reviewing. Loss, loss, loss. No gains. Oh, not moan. Stop, stop, stop this. I'm sick of caring, sick of watching. What, known or unknown, was the ways of life? I have no vested interest, even in this which makes life. Moan nothing. Hate, hate, hate. I hate those who take away and do not have as good to offer. I hate them. I hate the carelessness. Anyone who sees into time and through space, that person becomes a threat. Olson undoubtedly threatened people because he not only noticed what they hadn't noticed, he scrutinized and discovered significance in things that most people ignored. This was the place where Charles recognized both the continuity of how people had been and what they'd done, 
and how they first saw it, the, the, first, the, the eyes that first saw this whole prospect, and, and, and then what changed it. Well, it's not just to go back to some imagined pristine moment of idyllic existence, but to, but to yield, to, to give up this manic sense of authority or paternalism that simply only recognizes itself as overwhelming what it lives with rather than living with it. When he talks about Polis is eyes, it is what do you see about what is happening where you live. Take a look, see what's going on, my citizens. Take a look around, what have you done to this once wonderful place? He had a view of how we ought to look at what's going on around us. He talks about eyes all the time in the Maximus poems, and he means that we need to use our eyes and our brains and try to find a way of living that honors the past and makes the present as good as possible. People have been made to think that they don't possess any history, whereas everybody possesses history. Everybody is a historical being just because you live from one point to another. When you think that you don't possess any history, it becomes much easier to be manipulated in a much larger sense. One layer gets torn down and then you build new and nobody remembers what happened here before. And partially that perpetuates this continual consumption, you know, often at the cost of people who were there. And, and that's where Olson was digging. He was digging into a very particular small spot deep you know, as deep as you could go into the Ice Age, you know, um, and, and right into the present. And there is a relationship between the Ice Age and the shopping mall, you know. Uh, but people don't see that. We've been taught not to see that. We've been taught that things don't have a price. He wished people to know their place, to relate to it directly, and to build it as a place that they value. It's a, it's a, it's a moral project. It really was. So here, Heloria, the dog's upper lip kept curling in his sleep as I was drawn to the leftward to watch his long, sharp jaw and sick brown color gums, the teeth flashing even as he dreamed. Maximus is a whelping mother giving birth with a crunch of his own pelvis. He sent flowers on the waves from the mole of Tyre. He went to Malta, from Malta to Marseille, from Marseille to Iceland from Iceland to Promontorium, Finlandia. Flowers go out on the sea. On the left of the Promontorium Settlement Cove, I am making a map of Monday. It is to include my being. It is called here, at this point and point of time, Peloria, November 12th, 1961. You know, you put him in such words where, you know, it might take a po you know, a poetry reader to understand it right away and what he was talking about, but then someone like me that doesn't read poetry, maybe I'd have to read the same verse five times before I understood what exactly he was talking about. Lover's desire just no, lover's desire just plainly. The rest of it, the rest of love is the same as life. How well it stands up. He had a real good feeling for, you know, what Gloss was really all about. And I think that's what disturbed him, that he saw that that was disappearing. But everything changes. If you were to go back and look at the first line of the Kingfishers, what does not change is the will to change. And if there's anything that could help the world today, it would certainly be change. For me, that's his legacy. He informed everyone who read him, 
that we do have the ability to change, that we don't have to resign ourselves to what we're handed, what we inherit, uh, that we can uh, create new forms. It's my first time here and I'm very uh, happy to discover that the city seems to be in a way the same. I came to see a police and I wasn't disappointed. It seems that it is still in a way the police also described and imagined. I wrote a poem on a postcard in that snappy way you do. These days, this is to Bill Williams, Penny Postcard. These days, whatever you have to say, leave the roots on, let them dangle in the dirt just to make sure where they come from. When he came to visit me in uh, Connecticut, first thing I said to him, because he, he moved in for really the rest of his life, I'm surprised you want to leave Gloucester. It's Root City. He uses the phrase Root City. I said, after all, it's Root City. And he yelled, like, I don't have any roots in that city. There was a sense that it hadn't come out like, it hadn't really worked in the way that he had imagined in 1950, in the, in the intervening 20 years. Things just got worse as he lived on and they weren't, he wasn't really forging a republic on Watch House Point after all. I was visiting here and uh, I had to borrow his beach wagon, which had no reverse on it. I went out to get uh, some sandwiches. All of a sudden I discovered there's no reverse. I managed to get back, but I mean, how do you back up? How do you park? How do you do? And so I came back and I said, there's no reverse on your car. And he looked at me as if there should be no reverse on any car and said, let me tell you something. Never get yourself in a position where you have to go backward. When he's dying, I come to the hospital. We're going to get him into the ambulance and take him to New York. He was going there to have an operation for liver cancer. The ambulance drivers wheel Olson down to the, the ambulance, and you, you go in head first. But he stopped that and screamed that this is no way. I go forward only. One point he wakes up and he, he recited the speech from King Lear. Poor naked wretches, wheresoever you are. And then he started to feel the pain and was in intense pain and wanted painkillers, but the ambulance drivers had no painkillers. They had nothing but water. They soon drank all the water. So he grabbed my arm and would squeeze it like white with his pain. He wanted 10 more years. He wanted, of course, a hundred more years. If he were alive today, he'd still be doing this. Because again, it was, a, it was his way of living. It wasn't a way of writing poems. It wasn't a, my book will be finished. He would have continued and continued. Maximus gives me more of an idea of, more an idea of the span, the span of possibility of time and how to draw all of these things together. And all the different views sort of radiate from, from one moment, which becomes that eternal present. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the thing rather than the sort of symbol of something else, you know, always the, always the, the particular thing. One thing that really impresses me about this, just coming from also a small town, trying to get people to figure out why, you know, the, the field that they used to play, you know, fly kite in or something has become a Walmart. This, I think, is crucial. The local is not a place, but a place in a given man. What part of it he has been compelled or else brought by love to give witness to in his own mind. And that is the form. That is the whole thing, as whole as it can get. The making, the process, and what you see and who you are, it's one whole thing. That's very important. That's a very dif different way of, 
a writing also, not only a reading, a writing of understanding. It's one whole thing. blowing crazy lights at night and as I write in the day light snow covering the water and crossing the air between me and the city love the world and stay inside it concentrate one's own form holding every automorphism thank you welcome welcome on behalf of my father, thank you for all coming. It's a, it's a good thing that poetry is still alive, and I think it's good that the society is manifesting these ideas that my father stuck his life on. I think if he was here today, he'd, uh, he'd be smiling, and he would love all of this attention. <laughs> so, was this a mechanical work I had to do? This some mechanical it looks like they haven't turned his brain up. No, 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 no. Uh, I believe there is simply ourselves, and uh, where we are has a particularity which we better use, uh, because that's about all we got. I mean, otherwise we're running around looking for somebody else's stuff. The streets you live on, or the clothes you wear, or the color of your hair, the truth lies solely in uh, what you do with it, and that means you. Yeah, I'll face the future. That way, with the, the hair over the head, that's home, and that's it, and there's the, the future. Oh, Father Pelopes, otherwise known as Mudface, founder of Dogtown. That sort of reason Leave things alone It is not bad To be pissed off Where there is any Conditions imposed By whoever No matter how close Any quid pro quo With my back for dog town over the crown of gravelly hell. 